Oh yeah, they're going all out. Yeah. All right, you're on. All right. Um, so I'm Trevor Wagner. This is Colin Chambers, direct in the scenes. And we're here today to help teach you how to avoid getting a computer virus. If you're here for the how to not get COVID, that's in a different class, I think. <laughs> but um, we are unfortunately doing it uh, virtually um, because I had an exposure a couple of weeks ago. I'm finally getting healthy again. I think I'm going to be back in the office tomorrow, but um, I didn't want to put anybody at risk. So I'm still trying to avoid any community areas. So um, thank you for your patience and willingness to uh, meet with us in this format. Um, there's a lot of different things that this class is uh, compiled of, and it comes from like safe internet use, uh, passwords, multi-factor authentication, a lot of things that you hear in a bunch of our classes. Um, but we want to give you the basis and foundation for how to avoid getting a virus on your computer, everything from safe practices, the software that you can have on your computer, and some tips and tricks here and there. So before we get started, I always like to let Colin show us where we can access these presentations. We don't print them off anymore because it's a lot of slides and they take up a lot of room and a lot of paper. So um, we've put them on the Mankato Computer Technology website. So Colin will show you guys how to get to those now. Yeah, so uh, mankatotext.com is the uh, the homepage for the Mankato Computer Technology website. If you search for Mankato Computer Technology through Google, it should hopefully be the first result. Uh, but otherwise, you can go to Mankato Text. That's textplural.com. Um, and from this homepage, uh, you can go to the About button uh, up here at the top. You'll get this little pop down menu and click on presentations um, where fittingly enough, all of the presentations that we have done through for Vine over the past couple of years are listed here. Um, so you can go back and enjoy old ones or you can follow along with today's or refer to today's later on. If you click on this, it should open up uh, a PDF of the presentation in your browser um, and you can go through it uh, in your internet browser. Otherwise, if you hit this down arrow button, uh, that'll download it locally onto your computer, um, or you can print it if you would like to print 29 slides. It's not as bad as, as some of our other ones. So, I'm trying to get uh, better. <laughs> um, so again, uh, from mankatotext.com, from the homepage, if you just go to the about button, click on presentations. It should be the first one here. Just click on the name and it'll take you right to it. Colin, I'm going to throw, if you leave this up for just a second, um, I want to just throw a curveball at you. So on the bottom of the first slide, there is a hyperlink. And I know you said download it, but does it download it as a PDF or can you interact with the PDF if you download it that way? Just so that people can see that there's links in the presentations and you can use those oh, links. If you were to use it, uh, if you were to open it uh, as a download, could yeah. you, like, are the links working? Yeah, they should right. be, okay. uh, because that's what I uploaded this from. Okay. So I had converted this to a PDF. Here's here's the uh, the file open in another PDF viewer. Um, okay, and yeah, the hyperlink works right away. That's yeah. awesome. Um, you'll have to give it permission if you're using Adobe, um, okay. because it doesn't want to necessarily allow links by default but if you click allow it'll it'll open it up okay great very cool um so that's how you can access all of our presentations online and um refer to things that we've done in the past and stay uh, if you have your computer or your phone or something today and you wanted to stay along with it we can do that as well <clears throat> so um i do just get a lot of this information from the internet and um i've gotten I'm, i've always trusted colin a ton um with all my technology stuff but i did kind of give this, him this one as early as i could to try to ask for what products that they're using and seeing around the store um just to say besides the products that are automatically included on your computer especially if it's an apple or a microsoft platform um what kind of extra components that they're using or recommending at this time so with that, we'll kind of go into the steps. So um, different things that you might hear a virus called, um, a worm, Trojan, malware, ransomware. Um, these are all different things that can cause you problems on your computer. Um, people trying to put software on your computer, things that'll spy on your computer, things that'll lock up your data. 
and uh, we want to try to keep you as safe as possible and not have you get any of these. So if you use the internet at all, it's a good idea to think about antivirus protection. Um, another thing Wes always told me was that, it, you know, if you use your computer uh, and you have online banking, you should probably log into your bank account every day and just check your balance. So this is another one of those just kind of basic computer safety things that if you're using your computer, you should be aware of how to try to keep it safe. So um, viruses can infect your devices with malware. Um, they can steal your personal information, delete files, slow down your computer, computer or cause it to stop working altogether. So we're gonna give you some tips on how to spot a virus, what to look for on your computer, and then how to prevent getting them in the future. So malware, um, if you think of the term software um, or hardware, that's usually what you hear when you hear about computer terms. Malware using mal, the prefix for bad, is gonna be like bad software. So these are bad programs that end up infecting your computer. Um, and most of us have had to deal with some kind of computer virus or some sort of malware by now. Um, it's usually not fun. It causes your computer to be slow. It's hard to get rid of. It um, can take a lot of time to get rid of these things or find what's actually causing your computer not to work right. And it can be very frustrating. So we're here to try to help eliminate some of those problems or at least help you narrow down uh, how to fix your computer if you think you have malware. So um, computers kind of by nature, um, I think of the... Uh, like the pharmacy commercials lately where they say like, oh, you ever wake up tired? And you're like, oh, I have this, write this down. So um, computers never seem to work as fast and as smooth as we want to, but if they start slowing down unexpectedly or behaving in an unusual way, um, we usually should suspect that we have a virus. Now over time, uh, computers will get slow, they'll fill up with information, the hard drives will get full. There's little things that naturally occur that can cause a computer to slow down, but um, if it quickly changes or you notice a drastic change really quick, you might want to be alerted that you could have a virus um, or some kind of malware. So some are malicious where people are trying to steal your data, get money from you, and others are just annoying. People do it just to see if they can get past, um, past your protection and see if they can um, you know, cause your computer to stop working as well. If you think of it just like a real virus, you know, you have like the common cold and it's annoying and it's bad, it's not fun or convenient, but then, you know, you have like your COVID-19 that can knock you off for weeks at a time. So um, same kind of thing with computers. The worst culprits that are out there right now are called hijackers. And these are programs that can take over your browser or worse yet, your computer. So this helps the people on the other side that are um, putting the software on your computer. It helps them to track your key logs, um, what programs you're using, what websites you're going to, what passwords you're using, and those can all cause real problems if those get into the hands of somebody that's trying to do bad things to your computer. So um, I've had to try to get rid of these evil programs from personal computers and work computers in the past. I'm sure you guys have too. Um, I think I still have a thumb drive that Colin gave me of magical fix-its of uh, like every kind of software, malware, a uh, cookie removal program that he had tried and said to recommend. So um, we're going to give you some tips on how to prevent malware from infecting your computer and keeping your hardware safe. So knowing the signs of infection, um, even if you have the best protection of out, uh, out there and, you know, just like having the antivirus, you can still get sick. Even if you have the vaccine, you can still get sick. So what we're trying to do is make sure that you keep your system up to date, keep yourself protected. Um, knowing how to identify a virus on your computer. So um, these are some things that I mentioned that obviously your computer gets slower over time, but these are things you can look for. So if you have repeated error messages, so you get errors that pop up on your screen that you didn't used to get, and they pop up very often. Um, usually a quick email or a phone call down to Mankato Computer Technology, you can say, hey, I'm getting this error on my computer. What does it and they'll either say, oh, it's nothing. You can just do this and reset it. Or if you bring it in, we can help you. Or they might say like, oh, you probably have a virus. We should bring it in and take a look at it right away. Um, if your computer unexpectedly shuts down or locks up, those are usually a good sign that there's something wrong with your computer. It should work pretty well. Um, if it slows down, like I said, it's going to have to be a drastic, like it was working yesterday and it's not working today. Not so much like over a long period of time. Um, if it's very hard to shut down or restart, um, a lot of times shutting down or restarting your computer helps 
um, fix a lot of the problems. But if you have a hard time restarting it, that's why, because they don't want you to be able to restart your computer. They want to keep that virus running on the back in the background. Um, if you see new toolbars that you didn't install or shortcuts that you don't that you're not used to seeing, um, that's usually a good sign uh, that somebody's infected your virus. If your home page is changed, so when you log onto the internet, it doesn't take you to where you usually go. Um, if you have a laptop or a tablet, if the battery drains rapidly, it's usually because there's something running in the background that's taking up a lot of the memory, um, causes the battery, causes the computer to work harder and the battery to drain faster. And any of these could be a sign that your computer is infected. If you see more than one of these signs, you almost surely have a virus. So the easiest way to do that is to make sure all your software is updated, perform a scan, and you can also search for online forums. So when we say software is updated, we're not necessarily talking about just the virus software, um, you want to make sure that the software that you're using on your computer is up to date. So by using, if you're using Microsoft products, if you go to the Microsoft store, there in the top right corner, you can just hit download and update and it'll show you what you need to get updated. Um, and then you can also op, uh, update your operating system. So we'll talk about all those. And then if we have some time at the end, which I think will, Colin can show us uh, how to do it on the computer, how to go to the Microsoft store and make sure everything's up to date. So um, some people don't have an antivirus or malware protection on their computer. Now, Windows has put it on there automatically with Windows Defender. Um, you just have to make sure that that's on and updated. It should default on when you get your computer. Um, this protection is a must have first step in keeping your computer virus free. Colin, on other operating systems, I'm assuming Apple has uh, Apple doesn't actually have uh, a, an active antivirus scanner the way that Microsoft does. It has okay. some remediation tools that are active in the background. Um, and for a long time, they sort of benefited from security through obscurity, which is because they had such a small portion of the market share. Uh, there weren't a lot of viruses being written for for Mac OS because it, it just didn't pay to do it. It was such a small portion. But since uh, Apple has grown in popularity over the last 10 years or so, uh, Mac viruses are becoming more prevalent. And there, there are now a lot of third parties, um, software companies that have have jumped up into that space and are offering uh, antivirus for Macs. Colin, do you recommend any aftermarket antivirus just to get started or do you wait until somebody has had like repeated problems getting viruses or malware? For most people, I think Windows Defender is a sufficient antivirus program if you're using a PC. Um, the the nice thing about it is that it has really good seamless integration with all the things that Windows does. Um, and it it updates automatically. It always tells you if there's a problem or if it's not running properly. Um, and it, it doesn't have a super heavy performance footprint on the computer, which is a, a frequent complaint about some of the other third party antivirus programs. If you're somebody who has gotten a lot of viruses in the past or if you're doing something crucial um, with financial data or you know, uh, you're, you're preparing all your friends' taxes, something like that, um, it, it would be a good idea to invest in a premium antivirus. Um, the, the ones that we uh, resell here are Webroot, which is a fantastic antivirus. We sell the, um, the enterprise version, which, which is like a managed antivirus. So it sends us a message if it encounters a, a threat that it can't clean up on somebody's computer. Um, or there's a really good standalone program called Viper, uh, which is pretty affordable and very efficient as well. So Colin, based on the fact that like a Windows computer, let's just talk about Windows for a while, unless anybody has any specific Apple questions. Like if a computer comes with Windows Defender, and we've talked about bloatware and some of the other programs like McAfee and some of the other ones that they might tack on at a, like a big box store when you get your computer. Should you delete those antiviruses or should you just leave them on for the 30 days? I always find that they're really hard to delete like after you get through your 30 day trial or there's always some trail of like, this is outdated or this is no good anymore. So like, should you get rid of those and just start with Windows 
defender, then look for what those aftermarket ones that you recommended, or how do you recommend going about that if you get an antivirus program that's not one of the two you recommended, but it comes with your computer when you get started? Yeah, and I, I also should I should say that um, just because I recommend those two doesn't mean that there aren't other good programs that are, are decent and offer good levels of protection. Um, there is a balance with um, performance, though, that I think is, you know, McAfee especially is is really lacking in balance so that it, it becomes a very heavy resource intensive program. Um, and it is unfortunately loaded on tons of computers straight from the factory. Um, so if I was setting up a computer for myself um, that I had just purchased from Best Buy for some reason, um, then I, I would remove McAfee right away and just turn on Windows Defender if there was a trial version installed on there. Right, excellent. Next slide. So um, installing antivirus software. So we've talked about these a little bit. Um, if you want to avoid getting a virus on your devices from the internet, installing and running an antivirus software is important. Like Colin said, there's a free one called Windows Defender that comes with your uh, Windows operating system, but there are the Viper and the web root that Colin talked about if you feel like Defender is not protecting you enough. Um, cyber threats have evolved. Everyday activities like online banking, shopping, and browsing can now make you vulnerable to cyber threats. Um, people have done a really good job of creating websites that seem like uh, the ones that you want to go to. They just change a couple of letters. Um, I know we've seen some other attacks where it's, it's email scams. We'll talk about those in a minute. But um, there's a lot of vulnerability things that if you're not paying attention to what you're clicking on and you don't have everything locked in really tight, um, it's really easy just to be like, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong spot. And like, uh oh, how many times have I answered my password on the wrong website? So um, viruses are a major cyber threat, which is why it's smart to keep your devices protected against them. And we just talked about a couple of security softwares that can help protect you against phishing and other online threats. Um, there's some email filters. And then I guess just real quick, I wanted to go back when, when Colin talks about um, McAfee being one of those computer programs that uh, takes a lot of resources. What that means is that when you click run to, to do a scan on your computer, it, it uses a lot of the resources, takes a lot of time it's hard to do anything else in the background and it can become almost burdensome where like Colin was saying, uh, Defender has a small footprint. So it kind of just runs in the background and you never really have to think about it. You're not gonna notice any performance or slowing on your computer where um, I notoriously had problems with McAfee where I'd hit a scan and I would try to multitask and then it, everything would lock up and I would never quite get the scan completed. So. Um, kind of the difference in um, efficiency and security, things you want to look for when you're installing uh, antivirus software. So um, <clears throat> next up on our list, how to prevent viruses is no surprise here, antivirus software. It acts as a vaccine. Uh, this should be all pretty uh, everyday terminology now, unfortunately, uh, against virtual uh, viruses. It can identify and eliminate the threat before you were even aware of it. Um, but just like, uh, I'm sad that we have to use COVID references now, but it actually works out really well. Just like you hear about the variants, the Delta variant, um, the vaccine can only stay ahead of what it knows how to block. So in this case, um, you know, you get your Delta variant, you get your Mu variant, whatever. And now the, the vaccine that you have or antivirus you have on your computer isn't going to be as good as the latest virus that comes out. So um, you want to protect yourself before you get the virus and stay ahead of it with the vaccines, if you will. Uh, Microsoft Security Essentials and Avast are both free antivirus programs that you can install. Um, is Security Essentials the old operating system one? Now it's called Windows Defender. Is that right, Colin? Yeah, Security Essentials was the Windows 7 and uh, yeah, the, the Windows 7 version. Okay. And then, uh, like Colin talks about, I don't know what the costs of Viper and WebRoot are, but there is always a debate on the cost versus the protection. So um, you kind of got to weigh those factors for yourself. And, and I, we both think that starting with Windows Defender and keeping it up to date is a, is a great start, but, but there are some other programs out there that, that have their pros and cons. So we'll talk about some more of those. <clears throat> and that's a hyperlink if you wanted to click on it and read more about the pros and cons yourself. So, 
Oh, back one, Colin, sorry. Now forward one. There we go. Oh, sorry, I must have missed track. Um, this might run regularly scheduled scans with your antivirus software, so use it. If you have it on there, use it. Um, and Windows Defender, I don't even know if there's a scan option when you get into Windows Defender as much as it is it just to make sure that it's updated and runs in the background. Is there a scan feature on that one, Colin? If you wanted to manually scan? Okay. Yep, you can scan anytime. Okay. So um, can we take a quick second, Colin, and go to Windows Defender? Can you is yeah. that bad? Should um, we do that later or should, can we just do it now since we're talking about it? Yeah. So I'm actually running um, Webroot on here, but this is what uh, uh, Windows Defender will look like. If you go down to the lower right-hand corner um, and you'll find this little shield here uh, with the green check mark after it. And it gives you a little dashboard. Um, if, if there's any uh, problems here, if there's any of these with like yellow exclamation uh, signs, then um, it will it will start popping up in the lower right hand corner and complaining all the time that hey there's there's some kind of a setting that uh, that isn't right here or we found a uh, that your your virus scanner isn't turned on or maybe that it found a threat. Um, if you do decide to run a scan on your own, uh, you can click on this virus and threat protection. You can run a quick scan. Uh, you can uh, go into scan options to do a full scan, custom scan if you have certain locations you want to check, like a flash drive or an external hard drive. Um, or you can trigger a Windows Defender offline scan, um, which will do a, a computer restart. But if, if for some reason something happens to your computer that disables your internet um, or uh, you're worried about it spreading to other uh, devices on your network um, that then this defender offline scan is a is a good option uh, to go line by line Very cool. um, some of the other stuff I should say um, there are some things under account protection and the app and browser control that uh, occasionally when it complains about them I'm a little bit dubious about the the actual uh, necessity from a security standpoint versus whether Microsoft is just trying to get you to use more of their prod their products. Because in most cases, the account protection wants you to sign in with a Microsoft account and get, get set up on uh, OneDrive and everything, which is, is good if you don't have another cloud service or something that you're using to back up your data, but it's not a necessity to go through Microsoft all the time for these things. Um, so if, if that's giving you troubles, um, you know, it's not the end of the world to hit dismiss on that one. And then the app and browser control, it, it is going to try to drive you into using Microsoft edge as well. And again, you know, uh, it's not the end of the world. If you, if you use another browser that you like better. So, um, something that we say <coughs> a lot when we talk about software and we talk about computers, but just in, uh, and apps in general, um, if something is for free, you're the product. That's a, that's a West saying, I think too. I don't know if he came up with that one or that's a Colin one, but um, I always try to keep that in mind. And I talk to my kids about that uh, a lot. Like my son asked to get an app today that is, it looks like a very trusted app, um, but it does have some online interaction. And I know that it's free to get the game, but to play the game, they're going to ask for money over and over and over to be like oh if you want a castle spend this much money and oh you want some knights by spend this much money and you want defend you know a moat around your castle spend this much money and like there's ways to earn it but usually then you have to watch ads and um it's just kind of an on, ongoing circle so I, I try to tell them like there's better ways to communicate and play games with your friends than to play one of these games that has all of these things that you end up having to buy lots of extras so or watch lots of ads so um like Colin saying with Microsoft, I know he's a little bit more uh, paranoid of the Microsoft uh, giant than some of us, but I, I also agree with the fact that I don't want to have to be solely based on all of the Microsoft platform to do my stuff. So um, if you have antivirus, which everybody that has a PC has Defender, you can go through those and identify them and you should be getting little triangle 
or it's a, I think it's a, yeah, it's a triangle with an exclamation point in it if there's something wrong or you saw the green safe signs that Colin showed us today. So um, set up your software of choice, have it run at regular intervals. Did Windows Defender have a schedule, Colin, or does it just run on by default like once a week? Windows Defender runs daily. Um, okay. And then it also scans um, executables uh, and downloads as a matter of course. So, so any, any new file that's coming down from the internet onto your computer, uh, will get scanned by the antivirus. And that's pretty standard for any antivirus at this stage. And then uh, executables, so programs, um, will also get scanned uh, before they, they're run. And Windows also asks you now before you can download or open an executable file, if you downloaded it from the internet, it'll ask, are you sure you want to download this? And you'll get the little Windows. Warning. Yeah, they're really... Uh, and and it's multiple levels too, because typically you'll get a, a warning from your browser. Uh, you might get a warning from Windows Explorer. And then when you launch it, you might get a warning from the user account control asking if you really want this uh, uh, program to be able to make changes to your system. Right. So that's where we're, when we're gonna talk about paying attention to being really safe on where you're at and what you're doing is really important because some people have designed these really well to look like what you think you're trying to do. Um, the biggest one I find is like printer drivers uh, that it gets really confusing when you start Googling printer drivers, where you all of a sudden you think you're at the Hewlett Packard store, you think you're at the brother's store and it's like, click here to download the latest drivers. And then all of a sudden you start paying attention and go, wait, that's not, the, that's not brother. That's not Hewlett Packard. That's not Canon. That's not where I want to be. So um got to be careful with those that's I think that's the biggest one that I usually see that uh because it's the biggest peripheral that I don't know I guess a lot of people don't have printers anymore either but um it's the biggest one I've seen that I've added up so um maintaining your software is the second thing uh like I said Windows Defender it's probably weekly updates that's part of that operating system update that I run manually like every Sunday I log in and just try to make sure my Windows operating system's up to date and usually when you click on that it'll say Windows Defender updates are available would you like to download them now so um keep in mind that it's not always the best solution but um it does for decent protection as long as you keep it up to date so uh make sure you have the latest versions of all the software that's installed on your devices um so microsoft store and um and the operating system we might, it looks like it's pretty easy, Colin, to switch back and forth. You want to show people how to do that now with the Microsoft Store? Yep, sure thing. Awesome. So this is another, this is like part of my Sunday routine is what I call it is like, you know, while the kids are doing chores and help clean up the house, I try to clean up the computers. So you open up the Microsoft Store, click on the three dots, and then go to downloads and updates. It's all really self-explanatory. Then you click get updates. And I bet there's phone and something else that's available for update. For some reason, phone is always available as an update. <laughs> but you can see uh, the software programs that are there. You should recognize all, sorry, I'm pointing at my screen like you guys can see me. <laughs> you should recognize all of these. If you don't recognize these programs, um, you want to go into your Microsoft account and start deleting them. Um, but anything that says Microsoft in front of it's probably a pretty uh, safe bet. Uh, Microsoft Messaging, Xbox, Snip and Sketch, um, which I really like, Colin. I don't. I think you showed us that at a class. I'm really liking that tool. Um, and then you can see those are available for updates. So you can click Update All, or you can just update the ones that you want. Like I said, the Your Phone app is always they must change that weekly or something because it seems like it always needs to update. Um, and you can just run this in the background, but you can look at owned, installed, ready to install, downloads. Um, all of those things can show you, are they on your computer? Are they running? Do they need to be uh, extended? You can also click use this menu to open them, which is kind of cool. So you can see like, well, what is that? Like, I don't know what Power BI is. I don't know what Dell Support Assist is. I don't know what the HEVC video extension is. So if you want to click on those to open them and you can go, oh, do I really need that or should I delete that? Um, you can look at that, but the good place to look and see if anything weird's popping up that you don't recognize um, as well as keeping everything updated. And then um, 
Colin, can you show the update and security page? I know we did security. Can you show the update page for how to do the operating system on yep. Microsoft? So from there's a, a ton of different ways to get there, but everybody should uh, at least be aware of how to get to the PC settings menu. Um, if you go to the start menu, it's right here above the power button. It's this, uh, this uh, gear looking thing. Um, opened up my other screen. So update and security is the last uh, section here. Um, and if you go into that, it will, it's another place you can go to the Windows security to check uh, the, the status for the works. Windows Defender. Um, but otherwise you can check uh, for updates by going here and hitting this button. And even, um, even when it says sometimes that it's up to date, if you hit the, the check for updates button, there are occasionally updates available if you, if you tell it to push again. Yeah, that's my that's the cool part about both the um, the store and the operating system updates is it'll tell you you're up to date or the store will tell you you're good to go everything's updated so. Um, like I said, I just kind of make that part of my Sunday routine of get up in the morning and have a cup of coffee come down to my computer and then just go through the updates. Um, sometimes you'll need to run them a couple times turn off your computer turn on your computer run them again wait till you get everything says hey you're good to go. And kind of run from there so. Um, Colin, I don't know much about Apple. I know I've had problems updating because I ended up waiting so long between operating systems, but do you have a recommendation for Apple? Yeah, so the, the primary way to update an Apple is to uh, click on the Apple icon that's in the upper left-hand corner on the Finder window when you're at your desktop um, and then hit the About This Mac button. It'll open a little window that has the specs for your your Mac and the uh, the current version of your operating system. And next to that, there's a button that says check for updates. And that'll always take you to the app store. And if there's any crucial security updates uh, or uh, performance updates, it'll run those from there. Um, if you're in the app store, there is an updates tab as well that will look for applications um, that need updates sort of in a similar way to the Windows store. Awesome. So um, we talk about this one a little bit with our apps and software um, is that just making sure that your software is up to date. Now, the hard part about keeping your software up to date is sometimes they make changes um, to the software and it's usually within mind to, to make you safer and to make it easier to use. The problem is if you wait a long time in between updates, it can be really frustrating because you can miss out um, a lot of times, if you think about it, when when a version first comes out with a toolbar, um, like the words are on the top and then it explains everything that you need to do. And then as the versions go on, it gets rid of the words and then it just has pictures. And if you miss the version that had the words, then you're just like, I don't know what these pictures do. Is that back? Is that forward? Is that refresh? I don't know what that is. So um, you want to make sure that you're staying up from version to version. So those small changes won't seem as noticeable as if you miss a bunch of versions and then download it you're like where did all of this stuff come from and i don't know how to use any of it but the idea is generally to make it safer um to prevent any security flaws that there might have been in and make it more difficult to people to put a virus on your computer so um that term is called software vulnerability and you want to avoid the viruses uh, to make sure that you don't have that vulnerability lurking in the background through an app or through something that's outdated. Um, the only way to make sure that you're covered is to regularly update your software whenever there's a patch. That's what you, another term for an update, or you can just update your computer settings to accept updates automatically. Colin, do you have recommendations on setting it for automatic updates? You pro, con, good, bad? Oh yeah, everybody <laughs> should have their computer set to automatically update. Um, okay especially nowadays uh it's uh the the and the way with that it works with with uh uh with windows now too is that um there are these feature updates that come out a couple times a year which are really big um and after a certain point um they stop supporting older versions of windows 10 um, meaning that there are, are big security loopholes if you don't install those feature updates. So 
um, definitely a good idea to keep automatic updates on. Okay. Colin, I'm just going to ask, it's kind of random, but is that like kind of the, one of the benefits of doing something like the Office 365 subscription versus just having the standalone version of the software? I know you're more of a freeware guy, but... <laughs> it's a similar idea. Um, okay. I mean, the nice thing about Office 365 is that you'll always have the latest version of Office. So rather than like if I bought a copy of Office 2013, after 2016 and 2019 come out, I'm not going to get the benefit of those, uh, the new uh, versions and the, any new functionality that may come out. Um, but if, if, uh, if I have Office 365, it'll always keep me up to date on the latest version. All right, so we've talked about it a bunch of times. Um, make sure, so there's the operating system and the store. Now, I think even in Apple, there's a little bit of separation there. It's the apps and then the Apple store. Um, so you wanna make sure that the operating system and the software that you're running on them are up to date, that you have all the latest security patches, um, updates, keep your antivirus software up to date. That's really important too. Um, new viruses and malware is being created all the time. So you want to stay ahead and make sure that you're protected before somebody tries to get to you with that stuff. <clears throat> and the scanning software is only as good as the latest version that it has. So try to keep everything up to date as possible. It's part of a, I try, like I said, I call it my Sunday routine or your morning routine. Make sure all of those things are updated, your software, your antivirus specifically, and your operating system using a firewall. Now Windows, I think is built into Windows Defender too. That's another aspect of that software. It's very robust and has all of these little things that we're talking about. But um, because you have an antivirus doesn't automatically mean you have a firewall. With Windows Defender, they are included, but just be, if you're running, especially a third party or aftermarket antivirus, it doesn't necessarily mean it comes with a firewall. So Macs and PCs both come pre-installed with firewall software. Just make sure that it's enabled um, it provides an extra layer of protection. Colin, can you go into firewall real quick in simple terms, what it does? Yeah, in simple terms, it prevents other uh, devices, um, network entities from making connections to your computer without your permission. So that's the scam you hear people call and go, well, just let me connect to your computer real quick. And you know, we can see what's going on. You wanna yeah. make sure that you're not giving random people access to your computer. And a lot of times when when scammers uh, call and claim to be from Microsoft or some third party uh, software vendor, they will use words like firewall and IP address that, uh, you know, people might be familiar with, but not really understand how they operate. And then they'll say, well, according to my notes, you've got uh, IPs from Singapore and Hong Kong and uh, and Bulgaria all connecting to your network here. Do you want me to, you know, you want to pay me $500 to clean this up for you? Um, and then you're you're paying somebody to uh, solve all a problem that, stuff on your computer. that doesn't exist. Yeah, and then they're probably going to do something worse. <laughs> yeah. So that's a firewall. Um, secure your network. So uh, many of our computers connect to files, printers, or the internet with a Wi-Fi connection. Make sure your Wi-Fi has a good password and that the password is strong. Um, don't broadcast on an open Wi-Fi connection. Um, these are router terms, WPA, WPA2. Are those outdated, Colin, or is there, is there something more advanced than those now? WPA is outdated. Uh, <coughs> everything that you buy now is gonna be WPA2 encrypted. Um, if you still have a router that's somehow miraculously running after eight to 10 years um, that has WPA encryption, uh, you want to update it, purchase a new router. It's, it's probably time. Um, and uh, that has WPA too, because uh, WPA was defeated uh, in a, a specific kind of uh, man in the middle attack. And WEP was a precursor to WPA and WPA2, so that was no longer uh, available either, or you shouldn't be running it if you have that as one of your security settings. Um, it's a good idea not to broadcast the name of your Wi-Fi network. Um, I know it's kind of entertaining sometimes, depending on the size of your neighborhood or your apartment complex, to see what other people name their networks, but 
Um, if you can avoid people being able to find your network, um, that's a good way to try to protect yourself from getting people to log into your network. Um, and then if you can still access with your device, make sure you have to manually type in the um, internet ID and the password. Um, you can set one up for guests. Just make sure that you don't have any security information on your guest network. Um, and if so, if you have guests that use the internet, you can provide a guest ID that has a different password, um, just in case your friends are evil hackers. So um, either way, you should have a private ID and password for the people that you really trust that are in your home that you use the computer, and then having a guest ID and a guest password, and not necessarily make it public for anyone to drive by and just guess it randomly to see that it's out there. Um, pop up blockers. I haven't installed one of these manually in a long time, but I'm assuming that they come with most of our browsers now. Um, so many attacks happen through your browsers. As you're going about your daily routine, hackers can often gain access to your computer from one innocent click on the wrong ad or link. Um, so again, I, uh, the one I mentioned was if you're looking for drivers for your printer, that was a place that I would get caught up a lot of time. But ads or pop-up blockers is essential for protecting your computer's data. <clears throat> don't click on open or download anything unless you know exactly who it's from. It's especially important with emails, which is our next topic. But before we move slides, just wanted to give a couple of manual tips uh, about if a window opens on your computer that you can't close. Um, one of the tricks that they'll do, you open the next window is they'll make, instead of usually you click on the X in the top right corner to make a window shut down. Some people will make it so that when you click on the X, it opens the next window. So while you keep pushing the X, it's just opening window after window after window on your computer. So if you get to where you can't close a window and you can't close the application, um, pressing Alt F4. So the Alt button, the ALT button, and the F4 button will close the most recent window to pop up on your computer because your mouse keypad, your mouse instruction may not direct the window to do what you want it to do. But so by using the keyboard and pressing Alt F4, um, it will close the latest window. My receptionist calls me probably once a week and go, what's that key command that I need to do to close windows? Um, she plays a lot of online poker and slot machines and stuff. So this is a way to help uh, get those pop-ups to close. Any other manual tips for closing pop-ups, Colin, or anything you've experienced there? Well, I should say that um, this, in, in a security sense, uh, these issues with, with scam pop-ups are by far the most frequent issue I see um, with, with people who have had security breaches. It usually starts when they're uh, a lot of times on Facebook or on game sites um, and they click on a link and it takes them to a website that looks like a Microsoft uh, error window. Um, sometimes it has sirens or uh, a robot voice saying, you know, your computer has been infected. Do not turn off the computer or you lose all your data. Um, and it's got an 800 number on it. Um, and you call the 800 number. You say, this terrible thing has happened to me. And they say, yeah, uh, well, I'm from Microsoft or or whatever, um, and I can help you fix this uh, for a fee, or they'll get access to your computer and start digging around in there before they even ask for any money. Um, so they'll try to get as far as they can into your accounts and, and stuff like that um, prior to, to asking for any kind of a payment. The number one thing you can do um, in addition, so the most, browsers have built in pop-up blockers now but the thing that you can do in addition to it is install what's called an what's called an ad blocker um and there's a few good ones uh the one that i use that are and they're free the one that i use is called uBlock origin um and uh it's it's very good it also happens to block uh advertisements on like youtube videos so if you're somebody like me who listens to a lot of music on youtube and doesn't want to be interrupted by ads between videos um it's it's super handy um but it you also, download that at colin was that through that that'll, that'll, that'll be in the google play store or the app store yeah so if you just search for um like uBlock origin chrome 
it should take you to it also you'll notice blocks the sponsored listings on your google results page as well which is super handy because a lot of times people will search for you know if i was to turn off um my uh you block for this page uh and recycle um and search for like uh brother driver um I'm I'm actually not getting any right now, but uh, a lot of the a lot of the maybe I'm getting too specific, um, but a lot of times they'll have a bunch of sponsored results uh, at the beginning of the list, and a lot of times they won't actually take you to uh, the manufacturer or the the company that you're looking for. Another, um, I don't typically install uBlock on people's computers because it doesn't. Uh, it's not all it's very aggressive and it's not always as user friendly as the other one, which is Adblock Plus, um, which you can also find by just searching for Adblock Plus Chrome. Um, and if you just click on, it'll take you to a Google URL for the Chrome Web Store. If you hit add to Chrome, it'll be on there in 30 seconds. Um, so it's it's a, they're both pretty easy to operate. Um, they'll usually be like a, uh, um, some kind of an emblem up here, usually the stop sign or, or the, the U-Block shield. Um, and it'll tell you how many, uh, listings or advertisements it's blocking, um, on any given site. Um, so sometimes if you go to, uh, something that has like an infinite feed, like Facebook or something like that, it'll be in the hundreds um for blocking advertisements so that's the number one thing you can do to block those pop-ups the other thing i should mention is if for some reason alt f4 is not working um you can hit Control alt delete um and uh open your task manager um from your task manager might be on a different screen column because i can't see it right now it there we go open. there it is um <clears throat> which will typically look like this for most people, unless you've clicked on more details. And from your task manager, you can select your browser, um, which is where that scary pop-up is being run is in, in your <coughs> internet browser. So this will say Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge or Mozilla Firefox or uh, Internet Explorer, if you're still uh, operating on something like that. And if you hit end task, it'll kill that application entirely um, then you have to remember when you go back to open that program again uh, these browsers usually have a function where it's going to ask you if it, if you want to restore your previous session um, and obviously you want to you want to say no um, because you don't want to just go right back to that that uh, hijacked page And then uh, was it Edge that was supposed to have like a really good built-in ad blocker, but it ended up like causing major script problems and stuff. I know it was enough to make me not want to use it. It had some like built-in. Yeah, that was before they switched to the <laughs> the Chromium uh, okay. backbone, though. So now it's now Microsoft Edge is essentially an uh, it's built on an open source version of Chrome. Okay. Um, that Microsoft has sort of put their own touches and spin on. So cool. So pop up blockers, blocking pop ups, closing pop ups, paying attention to uh, when they pop up is is a really good idea. So let me just switch this. There we go. Um, email attachments is the next one that we wanted to talk about. So. Um, we probably don't have enough time today to dive into all of the email platforms that are out there, but if you can figure out how to get into your settings, um, we, if you're having any of these problems, we can show you, but, um, basically I think it's defaulted now that most of these programs, Outlook, uh, any of the web interfaces will say, um, you know, don't download pictures, uh, they'll automatically block these kind of things. So, um, it'll verify attachments, but just kind of like you showed with that U block, 
Um, you can be incredibly restrictive or you can be a little bit looser depending on how much you use your email and how much junk you get. So <clears throat> anything with an attachment can be dangerous, um, especially if you don't know the difference in an executable file or what kind of file that it's trying to get you to download. Um, some of them, just like we were talking about with the web pages, can have stuff that you hover over or click on. And in that, within that picture, there can be an active element that can open another page or start a download. So um, <clears throat> you want to make sure that you're using the built-in software, uh, the built-in protection in your software, um, so that hopefully it'll be scanning it for email, scanning it for viruses, and scanning um, anything that'll create a bad pop-up on your computer. Um, spam is a big way that cyber criminals often try to spread a virus. We do a whole class on this, so I don't have a lot of time tonight to talk about it, but basically they're going to send you an e email that has malicious attachments and they'll send it out to just the hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not opening or executing any of the things that you get on those emails. You want to make sure all the email that you're getting is from somebody you recognize, from reputable people. Um, if you don't know the person that sent you an email attachment, or if it looks like it could be a phishing attempt, ignore it or delete it. Um, only click on attachments and download files from your email that you trust the person that sent it to you. Um, it's also smart to disable image previews, like I mentioned, because sometimes just an image can have something built into it that when you click on the image, it'll open something in the background. And these are all in the options and settings of your various email programs, everything from your Gmail to your Hotmail to your Outlook all have these settings. Um, you can configure settings to show images only from trusted sources. Um, you can have stuff sent to junk mail folders, spam folders, etc. So just depends on how much you want to dive into that on um, how much you want to set on your email. But because this class is about viruses, the email class is kind of a, is a separate thing. It would take a long time to go through all the things that you could do, excuse me, with your email. So um, but be aware that there's settings and you want to protect yourself there. The, the phishing scams, um, so 32% of reported security breaches, and that's a hyperlink, you can click on that if you want to read the article, um, begin with a phishing scam. Um, they seem like they're from a legitimate company, and the goal is to get you to enter your personal information. Um, I used to work for <clears throat> several event production companies, and they would send out like the maps and everything that you needed to know for your event that or the location that you're going to. And uh, and when one of those event companies would get hacked, you know, they would get all the race directors information, then the race directors, they would send out emails to everybody that the race director had on their email list. And it would be like, oh, log into this website to, you know, get your latest race day information. But you're like typing in your Microsoft login and password over and over and you're like, ah, it doesn't work. And you're like, oh wait, nope, I just sent my Microsoft login and password to whoever spammed that guy. So um, you started having to be really careful when people were sending a lot of stuff through Dropbox or Microsoft. So um, that was one way that I've seen the scams. They've been going through our work emails lately too, where it's like, click here to log into this and you know, type in your email and login password. And it's like, it, all it takes is one time and it doesn't work and you go, oh, maybe I typed in the wrong password, but yeah, it's, uh, it's scary. And I've, I've done it multiple times and then I've had to call Colin or West and go, oh, I think I screwed up and I typed in my password to a website that I should have typed it into. What do I do now? So um, <clears throat> one thing that uh, people do is like that you want to look for. Um, I think some of the most common scams you get are you, eBay used to be real popular. I think it's more Amazon now, um, PayPal. You get a lot of the ones that are like, uh, like think of the most common places that you shop. They send out a lot of them that look like that, where it's Costco or Walmart. So it looks like it's from a legitimate source. But when you look at where the email is from or what the domain is, it's not legitimate. It's a bunch of gibberish and it's, um, it's not at a, a legit email or domain name. Uh, the other thing you have to be careful of, which I don't know how many of the stories Colin, you have off the top of your head, but I know I've heard a ton of them be hanging around the shop there is like just changing a couple of letters on somebody's email or name that it's really close, like using an R and an N to look like an M or um, like Netflix is N-E-T-F-L-I-X but they'll create a fake website that is N-E-T-F-L-I-C-K-S. So it still sounds the same when you read it. If you're not looking real close, that K and the X look real similar, but um, 
you want to make sure that you're real careful looking at what people are sending you and who it's coming from. Um, other, other signals include misspellings, poor grammar, suspicious attachments, buttons or links in the email. And um, just like we say, like Microsoft and the IRS will never call you. A legitimate company will never invite you via an email to log in and provide personal or billing information. So if you, you know, if in doubt, don't click on it. If it seems fishy, pick up the phone and, and don't call the number on the, on the screen. I, I've had that one happen now too, um, where somebody was, uh, I don't know, it was another contractor. Now that I, in my current job, it was like a contractor that got hacked. We had done business with them in the past. It said to send them, you know, their, uh, a purchase order, or a work agreement, but they changed everything on the email side, but they didn't, they changed like two digits on the phone number too. So like when I went through and Googled it and I called, they're like, yep, we got hacked. Please don't open that email. Please don't send any payment information. So um, it's always good to make sure to not call the email, on, not call or email the email on the, on the email that you get that's a scam, but make sure you use the contact information. I think somebody was talking about that before class about, you know, actually having a printout of people's contact information so that you know what to look up in case their email gets hacked or in case uh, they even send a, a, a wrong phone number. So if in doubt, don't click on it. And Trevor? Yeah. I got an email from my aunt one time saying, are, are you, are, you a member of Amazon? Can you send me a gift card, blah, blah, blah? Right. I called the number that was on that signature for the email. It was right. So they, yeah. they had duplicated it to the point where they copied her signature. And of course that made it easier for me to ask, did you send this to me? And she said, of course, no. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a, a really popular one. And uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen, um, especially with uh, um, the pandemic with a lot of churches operating through Zoom and stuff, uh, there was a real uptick of scammers pretending to be uh, ministers or priests, uh, and they would they would find the um, the address that was listed on the church website, and then they would just change it slightly or get it you know from a, a different domain, um, and it would say you know we're doing a, a charity drive for a, a family in need and we need these gift cards or or Visa prepaid gift cards and things like that. Um, with companies it's a it's been a similar thing where uh they'll figure out who who the boss is uh based on the you know meet the team page uh and they'll create an email under that with that person's name in the email address and they'll try to send somebody send an email to somebody low on the totem pole saying uh you know i'm buying i'm buying for as a bonus for everybody in the office i want to i want to buy a thousand dollars worth of iTunes gift cards that I'm going to give out to everybody. Can you please buy those and send the send me the codes? Um, and uh, so, if they try the they try these things so much, you know, if they it doesn't cost them anything to to send out these emails if they do it a thousand times, and and two percent of the people do it, it it pays pretty well for them. So. There was one in town that was iPhones or something. I don't know if you remember that one, Colin. I won't mention the name of the business, but it's right. like somebody contacted a low-level employee and said, hey, order new iPhones for everybody. Yep. But it's like, so they ordered new iPhones, paid for them, but they got shipped to, you know, not to the people that were supposed to get them. And so there was no way to ever track where the phones went, but somebody got, you know, 20 brand new iPhones and um, that company paid for them. I don't know if they ever got their money back or not, but I remember hearing about them going around. So it happens and it happens right here in Mankato. So um, be aware. It happened at my church. The, the Somebody sent me messages from pretending to be our priest and saying that he was traveling, which he was. So they must have read the church bulletin or something. And then uh, like that he needed gift cards to get back to the United States or something. So yeah, the, um, the really pernicious ones are, are like <coughs> pretending to be somebody's grandchild um, saying that they're they're in jail or at, they're in the hospital and they need they need money to to pay bail or to pay pay their hospital bill or something like that and then, that it's an emergency so send uh, itunes gift cards to the hospital please. right yeah well <laughs> you know they've they've got there i've heard of people calling and claiming to be the irs and saying the sheriff is on your way to arrest you if you don't pay us right now in 
Best Buy gift cards, you know, as though the federal government is gonna is gonna take payment via that method. But once the uh, panic kicks in, that's all they care about. Right. It's it's all very socially engineered, and like that part of it hasn't changed for a long time. So uh avoid questionable websites it's believed that there's over 1.7 billion websites in the world and not all of them have the best intentions the bad ones pose a cyber threat will use a variety of tools including downloading a virus to your computer like drive-by downloads they'll host malicious advertisements getting you to click on misleading links. avoid clicking on links to websites with suspicious names such as mixtures of letters and numbers that don't resemble words um, be on the lookout for websites that share names with trusted brands, but have a variation with the URL. So that was the one where I was talking about like Netflix or, um, like I said, where they use an R and an N to look like an M if you scan it real quick, or you can't see real far away. Like I can't, um, if there's extra symbols in the web address, it's likely a fake website. Colin, can you say that you could still kind of trust the, like HTTPS, if you see the S for secure, can you still trust that? Or is that? Yeah, typically. I mean, especially if you're if you're on this is not necessarily for detecting fake websites, but if you're on a uh, a website where you have to enter credit card information to make a purchase, you always want to look for that HTTPS in the corner. Okay. So think before you click. Um, avoid websites that provide pirated material. So uh, if you go to websites that you you're like, I don't want to pay 99 cents a song through iTunes to get all this music. This place says I can go here and get them for free. Well, <clears throat> yeah, you might get some music for free or some files or a sample for free, but you're most likely to get some viruses or malware that goes along with that. Don't open email attachments for somebody that you don't know or a company that you don't know. Um, don't click on a link in an unsolicited email. Hover over a link, uh, especially one as a URL shortener. So that it's basically there's a way when you create a web address in order to make it unique, it usually has to be pretty long. So there's software programs that basically will shorten it to make it look more attractive and easier to read. And when you click on that, um, and it's hyperlinked, it'll show you how it works. Um, when you click on that, it uh, makes it look all pretty and nice. But if you hover over it, it'll show you what address it'll actually take you to. So before you click on it, you want to hover over that, what, that hyperlink just to make sure that it's taking you to somewhere that you can trust. Um, if you download a file from the internet or an email or a file transfer protocol site, a file sharing service, scan it before you run it. Like Colin said, a lot of that stuff's automatic now if you have Windows Defender activated. Um, but make sure that at some point before you open an executable file that it says, hey, this file has been scanned. It'll go through your browser. It'll go through Windows Defender, et cetera. So good antivirus software will do these automatically, but just make sure that it's being done. It's kind of a pain in the butt, that extra step, but it's really worth the security. Um, <clears throat> avoid pirated software. So there's a difference between, um, Colin's mentioned it a couple times today, open source and pirated. So open source, Colin, give me a couple of examples off the top of your head of like good open source software that you can trust. So like LibreOffice would be a good example. Chromium, which is uh, uh, the open source version of Google Chrome. Uh, Opera, I believe is an open source project, a browser project. <coughs> um, and those are like labors of love by by uh, coders and uh, computer engineers who um, are part of a community who feel it's important to, to create these accessible tools that should be free and available to everybody. <laughs> but what you don't wanna see is, so there's LibreOffice and that is a legitimate free software package. But if somebody's giving away Microsoft Office for free, that's where you wanna be aware. That's the difference between getting pirated software and open source software. So open source is designed to be free, but if you're seeing a patented recognized name and they're giving it away for free, where usually you have to pay for it, that should raise some red flags. Um, your computer will be at risk if you download that stuff, or it could be most times. Pirated software also, uh, often comes from difficult to find websites or peer-to-peer -peer sharing, both of which have users who may be simply looking for their favorite movie or, or those who are looking to spread a virus. So Without virus protection built into what's being downloaded, it's easy for a cyber criminal to slip something onto your computer that you don't want to have on there. Um, it could just be a virus. You think you're getting a movie, but in reality, you're just downloading a virus program or a Trojan horse. So be cautious if you're downloading anything for free, including printer drivers and software. And if you have downloaded pirated files, which is not recommended, 
make sure that you're using antivirus software. Um, so like Colin said, the, there's a step you could take to, if you're downloading stuff, you could download it to like an external hard drive so that it doesn't become part of your CPU. And then you could scan just your external hard drive to make sure that there's nothing on that before it gets into your operating system files and stuff. So um, keep your personal information safe, just like uh, you would in real life. Uh, it's actually getting a little bit more difficult to do on the internet. Um, hackers will access your files, not by brute force, but through social engineering. I saw a great meme on this the other day that was just like, like stop answering these questions on Facebook of like, what was your first car? What was your mom's maiden name? You know, if you look at those list of questions that you get when you sign up for like a credit card or you're logging into a website, um, a lot of those are the same as like, there's, a, there's ways that they put together those fun surveys on Facebook to be like, what was your pet's, your first pet's name? And it's like, oh, lo and behold, that's the same question they would use to log into your bank card. So um, try to avoid those. They're more socially engineered than they are um, like people actually hacking into your computer to try to get that information. Um, so they'll, the way that they'll do it is by just getting like one login and password. And then they'll try that on the most popular sites, whether that's gonna be banking sites, credit card sites, um, video sharing sites, Amazon, eBay, shopping sites. Um, so they're just going to take an email and a set of password or passwords that they may have found and then just try logging those into as many different things as they can. So you want to make sure that you're using different passwords <laughs> and uh, different passwords and uh, logins for as many of those things as you can. <clears throat> Be cautious on message boards and social media about sharing personal information. Um, I give a story, uh, most people in the class probably heard it before, um, and it happened right over here in Janesville, was that there was a guy that went on vacation all the time and always posted about it on Facebook, and then like every time he'd come home, his house would be robbed, and he's like, I just can't figure it out, and it's like, well, don't post on Facebook that you're going to be on vacation, so like even when we go on vacation, I take all my pictures while we're there, but I try not to post until we get home and go, oh, our time here was amazing, so um, lock down all your private settings avoid using your real name or identity on discussion boards so come up with a good nickname and uh, use it diligently when you're discussing public forum stuff uh, don't use open wi-fi um, nowadays with most people's cell service um, it's probably more worth it to pay for you know your unlimited plan or however much data you're paying for versus using free wi-fi at somebody's uh, location i like places that have a password i like places that you have to ask for the password I like places that change the password often. Um, I don't like to go onto anything that requires me to enter a password if I'm on, on Wi-Fi. So I definitely don't go to like a coffee shop that has free Wi-Fi and log in and check my bank pass, log in and check my bank stuff or log in to watch Netflix or do any of those things. So um, I think it's better to put down our phones and talk face to face with people anyway. But um, besides that, free Wi-Fi is just a way it's not hard to produce and it is easy to use to manipulate people's settings. So I don't know, Colin, what's, is there still a black van theory of like, if there's a black van with a bunch of like antennas and satellite dishes on top of your coffee shop, you probably should log into the Wi-Fi or something like that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think a, the best rule of thumb is uh, just don't be logging into any secure accounts while you're on a public wi-fi or, yep. or an account that you you you're not trusting it's airports not airports are notoriously bad i know a lot of people that have been stuck in airports so they've logged into their netflix and when they've landed in their destination it's been like oh 20 different people have tried to log into your netflix account since you got on the plane so yeah it's far it's far better to switch to wireless data um in those situations if you have to do something securely um, yep. than it is to use a public wi-fi um, back up your files. We do another whole class on this, so I won't spend a ton of time on this tonight, but um, back up your files. Ideally, you'll have all your files in at least three places, the place where you work on them, on a separate storage device, and off-site, like in the cloud. <clears throat> Keep your files on your computer, back them up to an external hard drive, then back them up in a different location. You can use a backup service or simply get two external hard drives and keep one at work or at a friend's house or a family member's house and they're in a safe deposit box. Again, this becomes part of like a Sunday routine is to make sure that all of your cloud stuff is backed up. Um, like I said, we do a whole class on this about how to set it up, how to use different storage devices and stuff. But Colin, there anything you want to hit on this one real quick? 
the main thing uh, is that if you have a good backup, um, then you you aren't going to fall victim to the worst effects of uh, crypto viruses, um, which have caused and ransomware is another word for them um, have have caused tons and tons of problems, especially with big companies getting infected in the last couple of years. Um, but I've seen plenty of uh, individual users uh, and small businesses get it as well. Um, and, and basically what it does is it goes through your computer and it scrambles up all of the data on your computer so that all of your files are useless without a, a decryption token. And then they give you a, they leave a ransom note that says, um, if you don't pay us, you know, so much money in, in Bitcoin or some other uh, untraceable currency, um, then you're never going to get your data back. Um, now, if if I have an external hard drive with a recent backup, or I have all my stuff backed up into the cloud, that's still a, a you know, it ruins my afternoon, but it doesn't ruin, you know, five years of work uh, on on my my scrapbook or all my kids pictures or um, or the novel, the great American novel that I'm writing or, or whatever it is. Awesome. Uh, so, but so, again, with we talked about like operating system and software. So there is a difference between backing up your files and backing up your computer. Um, we again, we talk about this in our whole in our class that we do on just backups. But just to give you a quick tip, um, basically, you know, if you back up all your pictures or your music, then you still have your music and your pictures. But you also might have a ton of settings on your computer. Um, the way you have it, when it turns on, what all your menus are, et cetera. And basically, if you back up your computer, think of it that way um, versus just having the files. Colin, don't you have some cute analogy for this one? Like uh, you have a, I thought you had a car analogy for this one. I can't remember, but like the between backing up your computer and backing up your files, I thought there was something. Oh, yeah, an image backup versus like backing up the contents of your trunk, I think. Right. Um, yeah, if you have an image backup, it's like a complete copy of the car. If you have like a, just a file-based backup, it's just having a complete copy of the stuff in the trunk. So, um, so that's the difference in backing up your computer versus just backing up your files. Uh, we've talked about this at a couple different levels is making sure you have strong passwords. Try not to use the same password, especially on your bank account that you use like on your email or your Amazon. Um, typically we use the same email address for all of our accounts. <clears throat> As a salesperson, I've been really impressed with several people and I always make sure to compliment them um, that they create an email address for what they're doing. So like I had a guy that was building a house and he had like house building and at gmail.com and then somebody else, they use their address of their house and create a Gmail address uh, for that. So you know, like 194 something lane um, and that's their address. And then you can send the bill to that or correspond to anything that has to do with that project to that email address. Um, I used to recommend this for people that would sign up for a lot of those free contests, like at the fair or at um, like at the mall. They're like, oh, give us your email and you get this free car. You can win this free car. And it's like, well, I don't really want that going to my Hotmail account or my Gmail account, but I'll create this special that's just like drawings at Hotmail.com. And then when I get email, I just know like that's going to be basically junk email that goes into there. So, um, but either try to change your email addresses or create an email address just for signing up for stuff um, and then have different passwords that go to each email address. Um, if you use the same password for everything or on many things and it's a it only takes seconds to hack all of your accounts. So use a strong password, use lowercase, uppercase, number, symbols in your password. Keep it easy to remember, but difficult to guess. Um, don't use dates or pet names. Um, I like to use a software that Colin introduced me called LastPass. It's done really well for me um, that it creates passwords. You kind of got to get used to the process that um, when it says generate a password, you should copy and paste that because usually the next time you log into the site, you have to um, recreate it. And sometimes depending on how you have it set up, it's like a 16 digit and it's all uppercase, lowercase symbols, numbers, and it's never easy to remember. So um, when you use it to create a password, make sure you copy it somewhere 
right away so that when you go to log into the account on the next thing, the email address and password are still there. It doesn't seem, it's missing a gap there, I think, on its automatic filler. I don't have a setting set up, right? But um, there's another one too, Colin, that you said you've been using besides LastPass. Is there another one out there recently? Uh, I think OnePass is another one that's that's got a similarly good uh, reputation. Um, there's a few other ones. Norton has a password manager that's part of their 360 uh sweets um i think mcafee has a password manager now are you okay uh, with using google chrome's password manager if it creates good encrypted passwords yeah as long as you are are being diligent about what devices you're signing into with your google account right um and having the right protection on those devices it should be fine okay Colin, how do you compare LastPass to one password I think they're pretty much identical, honestly. From what I've seen, I think what they're doing is uh, through their the user interface, um, as well as what they're doing on the back end. I don't I don't see any real strong differences between them. Okay, one last question. Uh, I was using the free version of LastPass. Um, supposedly, it's supposed to be able to. Put the information in, you know, like the username and password, and start up the uh, application or file, whatever. But I've never got the, that to work. Does that work better with one pass? I had to use a CSV file from Google Chrome, Tom, to get mine to enter it. So I had to download my passwords that I had created in another document, or if you've tracked them in Excel or in a Word document and then copy and paste that into LastPass in order for it to inherit all of mine. It doesn't, I know it says it automatically goes through your websites and picks them up, but it doesn't. You have to um, enter them one time automatically and then it'll let you know, do you want to change it or not? And that's where I was saying, keeping track of that whole, like, yes, I want to change it. And then when you change it, you have to like copy and paste it so that the next time you log in, which you should do immediately, you can log in, log, log back in with that LastPass password. It's a little... It's a little wonky, but overall, I've been impressed with it. <laughs> did you install the, the browser extension, Trevor? I did. Okay. All right. Because I thought I thought that that was basically what the extension did for you. but And I was early into it, so it may be better now. But I, yeah, I ended up having to hard code the CSV file from Google. I had to download it from Google Chrome change it to a CSV, then copy and paste it into the LastPass document, which wasn't that hard for me, but I'm pretty not, I wouldn't like, if I asked my mom to do that, I'd be like, there's no way she'll ever figure it out. You have to do the same <laughs> for one password then? I'm sorry, Tom, I missed that. Do you have to do the same thing for one password? Oh, uh, I don't know, I haven't used one password. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I, I only know it by reputation and, and sort of looking at their website. So I'm not sure exactly the, uh, um, it, it seems to be a very similar process to LastPass from what I've seen. Okay. All right, Colin, we're almost to the end of our tips here. So just some more password tips, which we do. We, I, would do I don't know if we do a whole class on passwords, but I know we have a big section on creating it. So if any of these are your passwords, there's a link here for the top three passwords in use. But um, one, two, three, four, five, six, password. <laughs> um, then people thought they'd get creative if it had to be nine digits and go all the way one through three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or imagine a zero on either end of this. Um, and then people wonder why we have security breaches everywhere. So um, I get real frustrated because I think our company makes you change your passwords like every six months. Um, but keep your data safe, create unique and complex passwords, um, include a mix of numbers, letters, symbols, make sure they're at least eight characters long. These are some just general rules of thumb. Um, avoid using same username and password combination across multiple sites. So if a hacker can access one site, you've left the door open for all the rest of your data. And that's where I think Collins, paranoia is not the right word, so I'll try to be a little more gentle, but using that logging into Microsoft and having everything tied into your Microsoft account um, gets tricky because you're just creating another email and password combination that are probably pretty popular or across several platforms. So um not having everything tied in automatically is a little one way to stay a little bit safer it's a little less convenient but a little safer so educate your family take the information you guys have learned today and uh make sure that people know 
Um, you know, like if you go to the coffee shop with your friends, like, I just want to log on the Wi-Fi here and check my bank account real quick. Tell them like, no, that's probably not a good idea. Um, or like, hey, look at this email I got with all these pictures on it from this head. I'll be like, oh, nope, you shouldn't open those and you shouldn't click on those. So um, could be a member of your family, a child or an employee who isn't aware of smart internet practices. If you have any doubts on who uses your computer, take a few moments to teach them the basics, review points from this post. Um, don't open emails or click on links from unknown sources because if somebody else is using your computer, they log into their email and they're like, oh, let me click on this. Well, it's probably not going to do much to their email, but it, like, anything they download is going to be going onto your computer. So a few moments of education could mean the difference between the cyber attack and success or failure. Um, so how can you protect your computer from viruses? Much of the defense starts with you. It's between your ears, the operator. Um, use antivirus software, keep your programs and software up to date, be proactive with your firewalls, pop-up block words, uh, strong passwords, your email settings. And like I said, I just set up a practice day for Sunday to be my update day. But the more you use your computer, the more you have to lose unless you diligently practice keeping that stuff up to date and knowing what your settings are. I should add to uh, just one real quick thing uh, is, and I've mentioned this in a lot of my other, a lot of the other classes, but uh, setting up two factor authentication for uh, your important accounts um, is, is crucial. It's a great thing that you can do to secure uh, your stuff. Even if somebody does get a hold of your password, they would need to have your phone or some other uh, second device in order to to get into your account so two-factor authentication if if you can go into your account settings on your most important accounts and see if there's a place where you can turn on two-factor or multi-factor authentication typically the way it works is you'll put in a cell phone number um, and then every time you sign in it will send you a text message with a code and you'll have to input that code to complete the sign-in process. It slows you down a little bit, but uh, it slows down uh, malicious hackers a lot. So um, in, in most cases, it makes it exponentially harder to breach your accounts. So, um, And Colin, I was looking like Microsoft Authenticator, is that their version of multi-factor authentication or is that just something... Different. Yeah, my, Microsoft and Google both make uh, authenticator apps. Rather than working uh, via text message, they uh, they sync um, a an encryption seed on on your phone and on their servers that changes independently, um, but the, based on the same encryption. So. Uh, you could think of it as like sort of synchronizing watches, except your watch is like a million characters uh, long. Um, and so at any given time, your phone has the same number on it as the, the Microsoft server does. So when you're signing in, you input that number through this encryption or this uh, authenticator app to unlock it. So that's another um, great way. And it's a little faster than, and it's kind of cool uh, because it uses uh, if your phone has the technology to use like your thumbprint or whatever, which is unique and identifiable. It's one less password to remember, one yep. less thing you have to type in, and it just recognizes your thumbprint and goes right to it, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> All right. Are we out of slides? Is that yep, it? Yep, that's it. All right. So um, pretty awesome, like four minutes to spare. Um, my voice is about shot. It's the most I've had to talk in a long time. Um, but is there anything we can answer real quick before we call it a night? I just have one quick question for you, Trevor. You yeah. talked about, if I understood you right, was that a CES file or a CSV file? Comma CSV. separated values. Yeah, yep. Comma separated values. It's an Excel file. It's basically like a table, but instead of, um, graph lines that has commas, comma separated values. Okay, well, do we wanna mention that next month, I believe it's October 18th, and the subject in keeping with the upcoming holiday season is buying online. So we'll go through some of those common sites for purchasing online and what you should look for and what you should avoid and that sort of stuff, right? Absolutely, sounds great. 
Well, thanks as always. Uh, great to see everybody at the Vine. Sorry I couldn't be there, but I'm glad everybody's healthy and safe. Please stay healthy and safe. Uh, we hope to be back in person soon, but I'm glad this works out. Colin, you're a wizard. I appreciate everything you always do behind the scenes or running the slides and moderating for us. Uh, I appreciate everyone. It's always great to see your faces and uh, thanks again for the opportunity, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Have a good night. All right. Take All care, right. everybody. Good night. Thank you. And then we can go on that first um, 